So, um, right, to start with, I'll get each of the panelists to introduce uh, themselves. So, Remy, could you uh, briefly introduce yourself in a couple of sentences? Yes, so Remy Cuer, I'm uh, in Paris working for Kaifirm, which is a third party investor in renewable heat projects, and notably with a strong focus on solar thermal. We've been financing and currently building a 14,000 square meter flat plate collector uh, plant in, uh, in France, and they're looking forward to finance more solar thermal projects. Thank you, Remy. Miguel, could you briefly introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Good, good afternoon. My name is Miguel Fasquet. Uh, I'm from, from Solatom. I'm the CEO of Solatom. Uh, Solatom is a Spanish uh, company, solar provider of linear FNL solar collectors. And we are like currently deploying our systems mostly in, in Spain. Thank you, Miguel. And uh, last but definitely not least, and actually the first one to present is uh, Barbel. So, Marvel, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, then get ready to start your presentation. Well, certainly. Thanks for the nice introduction. My name is Bärbel Epp. I'm based in the north of Germany, Bielefeld. I'm the director of a German uh, agency, which is called Sorico. And we are focusing on solar heating and cooling news and uh, technology trends um, all around the world. So I'm supposed to start, is it correct? <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Marvel. So, um, you know, take, take your time, share your presentation and then start. And, um, you know, in the meantime, I'll uh, remind those of you who joined after I made the announcements that we will definitely send you the, the recording, um, the video recording and the presentations. But stay with us because uh, this is your chance to ask questions to the three experts are here with us today. So without further uh, ado, please, uh, Barbel. Yeah, thank you. So I have the chance to give you a brief introduction into what's happening on the solar process heat world markets. We have a dynamic uh, positive development recently. We have started um, with our statistics 2012 with 125 ship systems and they have grown to more than 700. SHIP is actually a shortcut which you will hear probably a lot in this presentation. It stands for solar heat for industrial processes and it's used in general for systems that deliver heat to manufacturing businesses. The statistics I'm presenting in this presentation, they are mainly covered from Solar Payback, which is a project, an international project supporting ship market in uh, outside Europe, India, Mexico, South Africa and Brazil. We have questioned uh, the industry to give us their numbers of newly installed ship systems and we have identified 104 new ship systems in 2018. The key countries last year were Mexico with 51 systems, so half of the world market, so to say, China and India. We have good news actually that well-known brands have, you, have decided to use solar heat. So we have seen installations with IKEA in Singapore, Nestle in Mexico, Philips in Brazil, Hudson Agro Products in India, which is the biggest dairy in India, Unilever, India, Niame, thinking about more systems to come, Pepsi in USA, and so on. You can find a lot of photos of these nice installations on a solar payback gallery, which is online. And you can use these photos um, if you mention the copyright owner. So feel free to download photos. And if you have presentations to your clients or whatever activities you are running on ship, these are all ship um, projects and they are all well defined. So you will find the site, the year of installation, the collector type, and a lot of more information. It's available in English, Spanish and Portuguese. We have also set up, and this is the base of all our survey, a technology world map. And on this world map, we have more than 80 turnkey solar process heat suppliers listed. Um, so you see that we have a growing and committed supply chain that offer these uh, solutions worldwide. We have system suppliers which are ready to offer. This is the yellow and the orange part 
They have not yet references in ship, but they might be active in hospitals and other large installations in solar heat. And we have a lot of suppliers which have references to show. So if you open one of these markers, you will find a detailed description of the company with a number of references, also a link to references, their produced collector type and more information. Also available in English, Spanish and Portuguese. Another good news that we have uh, and actually entered the gigawatt size of installations. This is thanks to a US based company, which is called Glasspoint. They have, in the meantime, more than 500 uh, employees and started several years ago to concentrate on enhanced oil recovery. That means producing solar steam to pump it down into the air, make oil more liquid and bring it back to the surface. We have a one gigawatt installation under construction demand. This is the one on the photo with around 200 megawatt already installed. I-250 megawatt are under planning in California and one two gigawatt are in Oman. So this brings us and on the international agenda on big conferences because this is really big investing. So one gigawatt, if once completed, maybe in two years, would be even bigger than um, the SP plants. Well, but I don't want to hide from you as well that ship is really tough business. If you answer, uh, if you question these technology suppliers we have listed on the world map, 93 of them told us that they are not satisfied with their sales in 2018 because only 32 ship suppliers installed one system or more last year. So 70% of them were not able to realize a single ship system during the year. This is due to the really tough negotiations that many industry companies ask for, short payback periods, and often a lack of financing and low energy prices. We have asked them, this is, you know, these bars, they are based on 60 answers from these technology suppliers. We have asked them and they all agree that obtaining financing is one of the retarding factors. But we have also asked them whether energy heat delivery contracts are an important model to increase ship deployment. And they, to a high extent, agree to that. So you see over 80% strongly and uh, strongly agree or agree to this statement. And this is actually a positive trend because it will bring us out of these, um, you know, issues with the short turn, the short payback periods that industry asks and that ship cannot fulfill because the investment is always high and this technology only pays back over the period of low maintenance. So what we have seen, this is encouraging, uh, that ESCO models are actually increasing also in practical, not only if you ask, you know, not only in surveys, they are supported. We have a number of technology suppliers, well-known ones, that have added heat supply contracts to their portfolio, which is Modulo Solar. It's the market leader, one of the market leaders in Mexico. The new Paradigma is one of the biggest solar brands in China. And Millennium Energy Industries in Jordan is a big system developer. We have also a number of startup companies that focus only on ESCOs. So their business model is said, we will not sell hardware to customers, but only heat supply contracts. And this is to mention New Heat in France and SAWA in Austria. And last but not least, we have renewable financing facilitators that have broadened their strategy or their portfolio to include solar heat, whereas Beforehand, they were only active in renewable electricity projects like wind and PV. One is to mention QTherm, who will be a presenter later on. And one is to mention Ecoligo Investment, which is a, um, a crowdfunding platform, newly founded, a German-based one with, with international outreach. And they finance only ESCO projects in the range of 100 to 400,000 US dollars. So, well, I wanted to sort of gather you a bit uh, the drivers and barriers of ship markets. Some of the barriers I have already mentioned, you know, which are generally low fossil fuel prices, the, the expectation of the industry to short payback periods, which are hard to fulfill, the low awareness for ship, you know, among industry and energy consultants, Difficulties obtaining financing was mentioned. Also the small share of energy cost within total costs. So if your product has only 1% energy cost, it's not really a need to think about a difficult investment into a ship plant. 
and high planning costs because every project is customer specific. But we have also drivers, and this is worth looking at the right-hand side as well. We have uh, a number of companies giving direct subsidies, and this is for sure a good driver, like we will hear later from France. India, Germany, Austria, Netherlands, and California are to mention here. We have regions with economic competitiveness. I hope our Spanish speaker will sort of confirm that later on. And Mexico, which is for sure, you know, market leader and a pure economic market for ship. We have a large and committed supply chain that I mentioned. We have cleaner air policy in China, which is a big driver because they're really facing out coal boilers rapidly in the north of China at the moment, but unfortunately mostly with heat pumps because they don't have space in the big cities. But if there's space, often solar heat is done. Well, then you have on an individual basis, green and sustainable marketing, sure, solar beer or whatever you sell as marketing that you have invested into renewables. And this last part down here, I actually want to stress that because it's not really a driver yet in the ship business, but I think that there is a big chance. These are the networks, what I call industrial low carbon networks, you know, these are um, sort of interest groups where companies, and there are really big ones among them, have grouped to announce specific targets. So they commit themselves to say, I will do 100% renewable, by 2050, or I will do 20% reduction by 2010. So these, these networks, a lot of committed companies who have understood about climate change are linked and are working together and are lobbying together, but only on renewable electricity yet. So my chance I see here is contacting companies which are already committed, but explaining them that 80% of their energy demand is heat and therefore they need to look into renewable heat technologies as well. So this is my little issue here. The last slide already um, is a short brief uh, introduction into what we have done for Brazil. It's just launched this week, so I want to, want to mention it. It's an industrial solar heat strategy. So whoever is interested in Brazilian market, I recommend this brochure. We have looked into three industries, pulp and paper, food and beverage and chemicals. We have uh, calculated business cases. We have identified actions needed to develop these uh, ship potentials. And what I find extremely special about this publication, we sort of made it an, a small eight pager, very compact, only little text, very graphic oriented to make it easy to be understood by, uh, you know, fast readers like politicians. So who is interested into this uh, publication, you can find it for download under this link when later on the presentation is shared to everybody. So that's already from my side, you find the most important links here again. And I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion later on. Thank you very much, Pavel, for your presentation. Very interesting. I hope it uh, gives uh, our listeners well, and our viewers a um, you know, good um, food for thought for questions later on. We have uh, the first question already there in the uh, Q&A box, which we will answer after all presentations have been delivered. And uh, next uh, off is uh, Miguel Frasquet. Miguel, over to you. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. Perfectly. Right? Okay. Thank you. So, so thank you everyone. Thank you ATA Insights for the invitation, but of course, thank you all the audience that joined in for this webinar. Again, uh, my name is Miguel Fasquet. I'm the CEO of Solatom. As I said before, Solatom is a small company based in Spain and, and we develop linear Fresnel concentrating collectors for solar heat applications in industry. So the goal of my presentation is to show you uh, how is the Spanish situation regarding this type of, of applications and what is Solatom's approach to bring this technology to the, to the, Spanish, uh, to the Spanish market. So before we start, let me introduce you our company very, very briefly, I promise. As I mentioned before, we develop linear funnel collectors. We developed our system back in 2016. Um, very recently, one year ago, actually, 
we joined venture with uh, Indertech, which is the energy branch of the Spanish group Symmetria, a very good group in Spain focused on construction, energy, environment, among other sectors. So the result of this joint venture is a company called CSIN, which is responsible for the Spanish market. And in only one year, it has already five references in, in operation, two in construction and two more in development, as you can see in the, in, in the map. So what makes CSIN different from other solar providers? It is completely focused on SMEs like small and medium and medium companies. So for example, in the, in the left picture, you have one of our, uh, our last projects in a, small, in a small cork factory in Spain. And as you can see, it's like very different from the, the projects that we all are used to, to see, right? Like for example, in the case that Barb showed before, the, the, the one of, from Glass Point, or in this case, this is a mining facility in Chile very, very, very known project too. So why the, the small projects, why SMEs? So just to give you an, an example, here you have the largest meat processing factory in my hometown in Valencia, but forget about for the moment for meat factory, you could say IKEA or you could say Nestle, like uh, Barbell showed before. But in this case, it's a mid factory, 27 gigawatt hours of thermal demand with an available surface of uh, 2,000 square meters. And in the right side, you have uh, the equivalent SME. So it's, it produces the same meat, but with only one gigawatt hour demand and 10 times less, less surface available. So which one do you think is better for CSH applications, right? So uh, traditionally, most of the solar providers always look for the for this kind of big projects like like the one in the in the left side. But when you go into the details, you can see that in the case of SMEs, uh, they are not only sometimes more attractive market, but also a like bigger one. For example, they pay more for the fuel. It is easy to reach the decision maker, which is very very important and the time to, to get a final decision is also shorter. And of course, uh, you, you, you could achieve a usually higher uh, solar fraction due to the lower energy, energy density. So for example, actually, if you check how is the situation of this technology in Spain, nowadays you can see that small projects are in fact the, the most common in, in, in Spain, of course, so out of the 30 reference that you can see here, one third is in operation. The situation of another third is, is unfortunately unknown. 20% are dismantled and a couple of them are not in operation or, or in construction. So if you don't take into account the dismantled projects, you can see that the average surface of the projects are very low, 200 square meters. But, and also if you include the already dismantled projects, the average surface increases because during the 80s we have like a three big projects now completely dismantled but the, the average surface increases but it's still far from the big projects that you can see in Chile, China, etc. So as you can see the trend in the Spanish market is clearly showing that uh, is clearly showing the growing influence of small and, and medium projects. So, however, although SMEs could show some advantages, this market is not a, a piece of cake. The, the market is extremely atomized. Only in Spain, we have uh, 3 million companies spread all over the territory. In most of the cases, they keep like a very low profile in terms of communication. So it's very difficult to reach them. And also since the projects are small, fixed costs like engineering, for example, become significant. So now I want to uh, let me explain you how in Solaton we're tackling these, these challenges. And first of all, the most important, the, the market. So here you can see uh, all the industries from a specific sector in Spain. It's impossible to reach all of them, of course. And even if, if possible, it would not be advisable since most of the cases, the technology could not have uh, an attractive payback actually. So what you need is to filter the information like this. 
and not only solar radiation, also price of energy and available surface, for example, which is sometimes uh, forget. So what we did to, to, to reach this, this, this filter result is that in Solaton we develop an algorithm called Pablo, which stands for probabilistic algorithm for better lead acquisition. And this algorithm in the first step identifies the areas in which uh, the highest, uh, you can find the highest probability of having industries with, uh, with an attractive payback. So it does it apply in uh, consecutive uh, filters like solar radiation, price of fossil fuels, thermal demand. So for example, in this, exa uh, in this example for a specific sector in the textile industry in Spain, from the 8,000 municipalities that form the, the, the Spanish territory, the algorithm just filtered only 400. And in the second step, what it's going to do is that uh, it's going to gather information from the companies of this uh, sector in these 400 municipalities. And it's going to gather information like is available online. Usually it's business information, like for example, revenues, uh, number of employees, type of uh, product that you are producing. And what it does is with this available business information, it correlates with, uh, with energy information. So for example, uh, imagine uh, business information tells you that the industry produces, I don't know, a specific textile with a revenues to, uh, of 5 million and uh, 50 employees, for example. So the algorithm is going to tell you, okay, it has 62% probability that we have a thermal demand in the range of three to six gigawatt hours, 20% probability of having a thermal demand between six and 10 gigawatt, uh, et cetera, and so on. So once you have this energy information, you can actually perform pre-feasibility studies, and then you get the paper, the probability of having different ranges of paper. So at the end, what is going to the algorithm is locate industries with a, with a, high, with a high potential for this kind of, of, of applications. Now, what you have is a huge amount of uh, small and medium industries with high potential. Now you have to, to do all the engineering of, of all of them, which is <laughs> it's going to take an eternity, of course. Uh, so with the traditional approach, like big, big companies, big projects, you can afford actually expending time and money in using uh, professional softwares, there are a lot of them. But when you go for the, for the SME, it's, it's not possible because you have the, the, the volume of projects that you have to assess is, is, is bigger. So for that, what we did is uh, we developed a, a, an algorithm, uh, sorry, a tool called Respi, which is uh, available online. And you can actually simulate, even with your phone, uh, pre-feasibility studies for this kind of, of applications. So just to, to describe a little more about Respi, it's, it's free and open source. You can access online at www.respi.com. The, the source code is available uh, online in GitHub. It's maintained by a community of researchers and it has like an automatic mode. So, so you don't need to be like an energy expert to, to actually perform simulations. Because at the end, you need to perform a detailed engineering for every project, that's, that's of course. But with this kind of tools, what you can do actually is perform quick pre-feasibility studies in order to select the most attractive projects so you don't waste resources in, in studying projects with, with low potential. Um, finally, in order to, to be cost competitive uh, with such small and medium projects, we need also to change the, the technology itself. Um, because in big projects, you actually can afford in situ construction, you can afford building ad hoc integrations for each customer. But when you go to the small and medium uh, projects, you cannot. So that's why we created a pre-assembled standard module, like the one that you, you can see in, in the pictures. So our modules are uh, built and calibrated in factory. Then you put them in the position and deploy them as uh, very, very easy. So this solar field, for example, is like 105 square meters and it was ready to connect to the hydraulic system in only two days. So it's completely different approach 
uh, like uh, from the from the big from the big projects. So he, for example, here you have another image from another project. This is slightly bigger, 420 square meters, but it is still far from the traditional uh, projects and super far from, for example, glass point mega projects for enhanced soil recovery. So this is my last slide. Uh, what I want to, to say here is that with this pre-assembled approach, what we're trying to do is that the, the installation cost of one of our modules, which is roughly 10,000 euros per module, more or less, uh, has to be the same for if you, whether you install one or 100. And that's why we can go with a very cost competitive approach to, to a small projects uh, where we think and we believe that is uh, the long hanging fruits from, from, for this market. So to do so, what we, to do so, what we do is that our designs are self calibrated. So you don't have to calibrate uh, on the field and you can connect all the piping network in a couple of hours. So that's, the, the the approach that we follow for the for the solar field and we are also trying to reach and i think this is very important for the for the for the technology a uh, standard balance of plant balance of plant is all the piping pumps heat exchangers everything so we need to 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 reach and we are trying to reach like a standard uh, balance of plant that can be used in different integration schemes as many as as possible and just the final thought, of course, this approach has clear disadvantages when, when building big plants. So that's why you will never see a 10 megawatt um, <laughs> heat plant uh, from Solatom. But the, the, the good side is that if you go into Spain, you will see our modules in, in a lot of industries. So that's all from my side. I would love to hear questions uh, after all the presentations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Very interesting presentation. Oh, I see the questions uh, mounting up. Don't worry, we will answer them after all presentations. Um, Miguel, if you could stop sharing your presentation, yeah, great. And then, uh, Remy, it's your uh, turn to present. Yes, hello, everyone. So thanks uh, to Ata Insight uh, for organizing this uh, webinar and everybody for, for attending. So I guess you can see my, my screen. So as I introduced, uh, Kai Firm is a third party investor in renewable heat and energy efficiency projects. Uh, we are uh, focused on renewable heat and uh, not uh, electricity. And we are here to finance this project that are very uh, capex intensive uh, and to help and to partner with engineering, engineering companies uh, that try to uh, sell these kinds of projects around the world. So Kaifirm, as I said, is an investment company. So we, uh, contrary to Solatom, we are not an EPC company. We're not an O&M company. We always team up with companies such as Solatom or others in, uh, in the market, not only in, re in uh, solar thermal, but also in so geothermal projects, biomass, district heating projects, waste heat projects, energy performance uh, contract projects. We are uh, rather looking at projects a little bit uh, bigger than the one uh, that Miguel presented, so uh, at least above 1 million uh, euros uh, and up to uh, 50 million euros. Because if you want to implement uh, third party financing, you do need to have a project of a certain size. Um, and uh, I would like to stress that uh, as of today, we've mainly done projects in uh, Europe but our geographical scope is uh, worldwide. Uh, we know that uh, sunny conditions are notably met in a lot of regions in South America and North Africa, uh, the Middle East, uh, Asia, and so on. And so uh, we are uh, currently looking at projects on a worldwide basis. So if you uh, look at uh, this project and notably solar thermal, uh, what uh, everybody observes is that industrial um, sites uh, often have uh, an issue with uh, payback periods and often projects are very interesting from uh, an environmental point of view, from an economical point of view, but most of the time these projects are not implemented. 
uh, and that's because the industrial side, the industrial company won't uh, agree uh, to making the, the investment in the, the project. So that's where we team up with engineering companies, uh, APC contractors, O&M contractors, in order to have a bundled offer, uh, where, which is an ESCO offer where we sell the heat to, to the clients based on the heat contract that will be uh, with a duration from 10 to 15 to 20 years, where we agree on a heat price in uh, Euro, US dollars, and so on uh, per megawatt hour. And where the client doesn't have to invest himself in the, in the assets, in the solar thermal plants, that's what we do. We take care of the EPC, the ONM, if any, the administrative authorizations and so on. And we try to have a simple a solution that can be implemented uh, with the uh, industrial company um, so that they don't have to finance it, so that they can share or even <clears throat> de-risk uh, the, the project from a technical point of view. And we also facilitate uh, all of this uh, project structuration by being very proactive regarding the contractual negotiations and proposing of um, draft contracts. So in order to illustrate what we, we do at Kaifirm, uh, I wanted to present uh, a project we've been financing and which is under construction. It's a ship solar thermal project in France. It's a solar thermal plant uh, of 14,252 square meter, uh, which is being built uh, for a melting plant. So on the left of the picture, you have the location. It's uh, south of uh, the city of Orléans. So it uh, has a GHI of around 1,200 kilowatt hour per uh, square meter per year. Uh, the client uh, is a melting plant, and for those who uh, know melting plants, uh, they receive um, the, the cereals, and in order to turn it into malt, <clears throat> they need to, to have it wet and then dried, which uses a lot of energy, and a plant such as the one you can see on the picture on the right uh, uses around 80 gigawatt hour of heat uh, in the form of hot air per year. So that's um, very interesting for solar thermal because uh, it's a lot of thermal needs and adds uh, temperatures that are not that high. So regarding the, the location and the space <clears throat> that was available, so the, the plant is quite close to, to the city. of uh, So it, uh, it's the city of Issoudun in, uh, in France but we've still uh, been um, still been able to find some uh, available lands and uh, to find free hectares, which allows us to build what is at least today in Europe, uh, the largest solar thermal plant for an industrial site. Of course, there are bigger ones on the district heating uh, networks and also bigger ones uh, for uh, industrial sites in the Middle East but uh, it's uh, still uh, a project uh, which is quite interesting and that we hope to replicate uh, in France, uh, but also in, in other countries. Just to give you a little bit more uh, details regarding uh, the technical integration in the industrial process. Uh, so what's uh, key uh, in this project is that there's already uh, a lot of um, decarbonized heat that is supplied to the process. So first in the form of waste heat and also in the form of biomass. And what we have uh, very much uh, took into account is uh, that solar thermal uh, has to uh, erase and to decrease the consumption of gas that shall not take the place, of course, of waste heat or biomass heat. So all in all, uh, we uh, expect to commission the plants uh, mid of 2020 and to have an annual production between eight and nine gigawatt hour per year, uh, which will allow to reduce uh, CO2 emissions by around uh, 2,000 tons per year. Uh, so a little bit more regarding uh, the contractual uh, organization of this project. Uh, I think what, what is key uh, in order to present <clears throat> Kaifirm and press uh, more generally uh, the dynamic of solar thermal um, is that uh, at Kaifirm, we are not an EPC contractor. We are not an O&M provider. Uh, what we aim at is partnering, uh, partnering with <clears throat> companies uh, around the globe 
that provides these kinds of solutions uh, in order to uh, have a bundle offer with the e-purchase uh, agreement. Um, so in details in, in this project, we've been partnering with uh, French companies, which uh, you can see uh, on the screen. So uh, Nuit, uh, Delta, Eiffage, uh, also a Finnish company, Savo Solar, and a Belgian company named uh, Synoptimo. Uh, and we've been uh, together, <clears throat> uh, so organizing and, uh, this, uh, this project uh, and also managing the subsidies uh, aspects in, in France. Uh, which, uh, as a barbell stress, uh, is a big uh, incentive in uh, in France, which allows to kickstart uh, this uh, this industry, and of course all the uh, permitting side. Uh, finally, I would like uh, to stress why we think that third-party financing can be a real accelerator for the solar thermal industry, uh, more generally from a commercial point of view. Uh, as I said, when you go and see an industrial site, most of the time they will be interested by the solution, but they will not be able to finance it. Uh, third party financing allows three things. Uh, one thing is, uh, of course, that we are all in the industry convinced that solar thermal is uh, very e efficient and well, not that risky. But most of the time, if you go see a melting plant or any industrial site, they don't know the specifics of solar thermal. And so it's much easier to implement the project if the technical risks are not borne by the industrial site, but by a third party. And when you sell heat on a euro or dollar megawatt hour <clears throat> uh, per megawatt hour basis, then you take, it means Skyfirm and its partners take the risk that maybe the plant will produce less than expected. And I think that's a big push, that's a big argument when you try to sell a solar thermal project. Um, the second point is, of course, that when you see, uh, when you go and see industrial sites, most of the time they will tell you that they don't do projects with payback that are higher than 18, 24 months. Uh, what we do in order for a project to be realized is that we finance it with an optimized cost of capital and we are able to have heat contracts that are 10, 15 to 20 years and it really allows to offset the initial cost of construction of the plant on the long, on the long term and to have some uh, heat price that are competitive with reference costs such as the gas cost. And uh, last point, which is a little bit more technical, but if for big companies, uh, international companies that are under the IFRS 16 uh, accounting rule, uh, if you have a need purchase agreement such as the one we, we've implemented in the Isudan project, well, it's uh, off balance sheet for the company, meaning that since we take a lot of the risk, the industrial company will not have to uh, have a debt in its financial accounts, which is uh, for um, CFOs of industrial sites, a pretty important point. So finally, uh, as I said, so the, um, the project I was mentioning is still under construction, but we've got some uh, first uh, photo montage of uh, the project and you can see what we hope it will uh, look like. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. Well, thank you very much, uh, Remy, for your presentation. So uh, um, you can see that we have seen, we have uh, some questions uh, coming in. We'll start answering them uh, now. So um, one of them uh, is regarding uh, concessional financing. So we have um, you know, two uh, um, representatives here, for, well, three from the uh, CSH industry. So um, do you believe that the um, industries that were in the providers of CSH and of solar heat systems are aware of the fact that so uh, concessional financing is available? So perhaps if I, if I was to, to, to answer. I was going to say not all of you at the same time. So yeah, uh, please, for me. <laughs> no, um, I, I'm not specifically aware of it, uh, but that's also because we, we financed this project. 
Um, so it would be interesting to, to, to get to know them. But, but uh, what I want to stress is that regarding this project, we really have to be uh, hands on into the project and to adapt the financing to, to the project. Um, so I don't know if these kinds of concessional financing uh, are relevant when, you, when you're referring to solar thermal projects. Thank you. Um, and um, we have uh, a question here as well for you, Rami, which is regarding whether you finance projects in other uh, places, not only in, uh, in France, but abroad. Uh, the specific question is about Brazil. Yes, yes, we, we do. As I said, uh, uh, initially we were rather looking at projects in Europe, but uh, solar thermal, uh, there's um, much more sunny areas in other continents and for example Brazil, we are definitely looking at projects in, uh, in this country and other ones. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, the, there is a, another question here which is about the price for heat provision contracts. So, um, how do you come up with the price for um, at which you, you'll be providing uh, heat to uh, the companies that purchase it from you. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure strike price for it provision contracts. I'm not sure uh, what's um, so <laughs> what, what it means with, uh, with this question. Yeah, what it means is that yes. um, you provide a heat uh, purchase uh, contract, which is similar to a well, kind of like a power purchase agreement. So. I suppose you have a price per unit of heat that you provide uh, companies. So how do you come up with this price? And um, yes, yes. is a question relevant not only to you, but I think to Miguel as well, because you know the, the HPA is the uh, contractual structure. But you know how still how do you decide uh, which uh, price you uh, how do you price uh, your units of heat? But please, yes. Romy, go. Yes, of course, the price will uh, depend uh, on the main figures, which are the investment cost, the contract duration, and the operational uh, expenditures. Uh, and we have uh, an internal, internal figure, which is the uh, internal uh, revenue rates, which we try to have the lowest as possible in order to finance as many projects as possible. And uh, well, the, the general idea is the more risk you take, the higher the IRR has to be the lower the risk, the lower the IRR. And we always, of course, try to be cost competitive compared to uh, reference cost. Okay, thank you, Remy. And um, Miguel, one, one question to you. So um, how do you um, look at the, you serve SMEs. Um, so how do you decide which SMEs are, can bear the risk of buying uh, the, the projects. So, as I understand, you sell the units outright, so does the enterprise own the, the unit after they purchase it from you? Yes, yeah, exactly. What, what we are doing for the moment is doing turnkey projects. So, it, it, this could be like very strange, but I have to say that if you go to SMEs, they are not always up, uh, up to uh, ESCO model. It, this, this actually, this insight struck me a lot when I discovered and when I visited some some SMEs. But in some uh, traditional sectors like food and beverage, they really want to own the equipment. Don't ask me why, because I really don't understand. Uh, it was like very difficult to 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 foresee to to, to foresee these kind of things. But uh, for the moment, we are, we are doing fine doing chunky projects. And of course, we, we, we evaluate the, the payback period with the energy that is going to produce the systems, the price of the f uh, fossil fuel they are using, and, and the price of the, of the integration, of course. Yeah. That is surprising, actually. I would have thought that um, companies wouldn't want to own these systems that they might want to do the, well, like focus on the, the core business, which is producing whatever they produce and, and then purchase a heat from someone else. So why do you think, well, at least, you know, from the companies you spoke with, why do they want to own the system? 
I think uh, it was also surprising uh, for me, as as I said, it's probably biased because we only visit SMEs. So it's mm -hmm. probably completely different from uh, big companies in, in the sense of big companies. But I, I think uh, that they prefer to, to, to have the equipment because it's what uh, they used to. And they yes. own the boilers, they own the, the process equipment, they own everything. So in Spain, it's not really, still not really, um, I, I would say, like uh, very common to the, the, this kind of ESCO, mo ESCO models, at least mm -hmm. for heat. So I'm always, I, I always also found some people interested in, in ESCO models, of course. But I, I was suspecting like 90% of the people of the industry should prefer ESCO models. But uh, uh, from the, the visits and from the, the clients that we had, uh, they are like 50-50. Uh, they prefer turnkey, turnkey, like traditional turnkey models than ESCO models. Thank you, Miguel. So, uh, well, we have a question here that is, uh, is uh, um, you know, getting right to, uh, to the heart of the matter, which is, uh, uh, what payback periods are usually considered in typical ship projects? So, um, you know, if you're talking about solar heat for industrial processes, what are the typical payback periods that, um, that can be expected from a project in a sunny location, let's say, um, you know, with a good solar resource, let's say like southern Spain? Well, from, from my experience, uh, paybacks are often uh, north of uh, 10, 10 years, 10, 10, to 15, uh, 10 to 15 years. Okay. Well, what is your, your experience, Miguel? What, what have you seen in terms of payback periods? Well, it depends. For example, I, I can tell uh, in the case of, I would say that the, I will express the, the, the case of Spain. If you go to Canary Island, which are not, they don't have uh, cheap natural gas, they're mostly industries using uh, fuel oil. You can you can find very good uh, potential business case having like a payback period between five and four four to six years actually. If you go to a small a small companies outside of the natural gas network in Spain. Uh, with uh, with a constant uh, production, uh, or at least having demand during the Saturdays, you also uh, will find uh, payback periods between six to seven years, because they they usually using uh, propane or or diesel or, or gasoil, so that they pay in a lot for the energy and that's the reason they, they have like a very good payback periods. Okay. So, uh, you know, what it seems that, um, well, seems obvious, you know, but I think it bears repeating that one of the main factors that goes into determining the payback period is uh, the price of fuel. So um, you mentioned, uh, you know, any anything between 15 years and four years for a payback period. Um, what are other other factors? And then I have a, a question for you, Barbara. So, uh, regarding you know what the people you have spoken with in your interviews think about payback periods. Um, but um, yeah, so um, but before we get there, so what are the other factors that need to be uh, taken into account um, when you consider the, the payback period? What what affects the payback period? Well, first, um, we have questioned the industry and the target countries of solar payback, and we have really received answers from two to four years, which is the typical payback periods which are accepted. So this is very challenging. And I agree with the others that the mm. factor which is the most striking is the price of the fuel which is substituted. For example, in Brazil, we have found that LPG um, is beaten by ship in any case, you know, with medium irradiation sites. So you will reach nice IRRs of above 20%. So it's really nice and, and attractive. Whereas um, 
in in gas and um, and fuel oil, you have to look into the temperature level that you have to provide. Usually, it's much easier to mm. to get a reasonable payback if you provide uh, 50 to 70 degree with flat plate selectors, which are locally produced. Mm. As soon as you get above 100 percent, your payback will go down and your IRRs will go down because the equipment is much more expensive. So we have identified in Brazil, and I think this is probably for most uh, nations where they are not yet locally produced concentrating collectors available that, uh, you know, 50 to 70 per degree, which is typical also the, the malting plant of France and so mm -hmm. on, they are reasonable, easy if, if you have concessional financing, 4% interest rates to a re really nice IRRs. But um, anything above 100% a degree, as I said, is really difficult. You need locally produced collectors, which are at least 40% cheaper than the world market prices, you know, with importing and shipping uh, to reach paybacks. This is our experiences from the latest, you know, uh, study from Brazil. Right. No, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, you mentioned uh, a number of things that we hadn't taken into account. So you mentioned interest rates for uh, the financing, you mentioned the uh, temperature level. So for the, the people who are joining us today, so why does, who, who are, you know, perhaps are not experts in this subject, so why uh, does the temperature level affect the um, payback period in these, uh, in these projects? Well, this has two effects. I mean, one is that concentrating collectors can only use DNI. And we have countries where the DNI, that means the direct irradiation, is stronger than the general direct irradiation, like you have a desert situation where you have always blue sky. But in most countries, and we have found that in Brussels because of the cloudy sky, the, the DNI is much lower than the general irradiation. So as soon as you go above 100 degree and you need concentrating collectors, you have less irradiation that helps you to gain yield, but the equipment is more expensive. So that is, is this double effect which makes your IRRs difficult. So you need to either reduce, um, you to subsidize or reduce your really local costs. Okay, well, uh, interesting insights here. So um, we have a, a question by Elena Quadros uh, to uh, Rami, which is uh, um, essentially Elena is saying that uh, you <coughs> are um, enabling a HPA for developers that cannot offer it, and uh, you are taking most of the risks uh, upfront. So um, you know, what are the are there any remaining risks uh, to um, that the end user has to assume? Yes, I think it's a good uh, synthesis. So thank you, uh, Elena. Um, regarding the, the main things we're going to ask from the hit clients, uh, so we, we try to be uh, as uh, less as, uh, as possible. The first one is that they use uh, solar thermal heat uh, before uh, their gas boiler or fuel boiler. So uh, of course, if there's waste heat, we can use it first, but uh, they have to use any solar heat before uh, their gas boiler. Uh, and then the second commitment we may, and it depends on which project we were talking about, but we may also ask uh, that they uh, keep a certain uh, consumption uh, level. And if they go uh, uh, under a certain consumption level, that the price may uh, go a little bit up. But in most cases, uh, we uh, take the risk of the site closure, meaning that uh, if we have a 20 year contract and the industrial site closes down after 10 years, then it's a financial loss for, for us. Okay, thank you. And then uh, jumping to a more general question. So we have a, a question here that says, uh, uh, you know, what do you think would be a game changer to see CSH become as deployed as PV panels? So, um, so you know, um, you know, there are, uh, various uh, hundreds of <clears throat> gigawatts of PV being deployed and that helps uh, massively with economies of scale to bring down costs. So what would need to happen to have uh, uh, CSH deployed on a, um, being widely deployed? So perhaps, uh, I think, uh, uh, 
Uh, I think so, so Solaton solution is very interesting, uh, having a modular solution that you can replicate. I think it's one of the key uh, solution in, in the market to be able to standardize and replicate. But of course, then I think it will also have to, um, to you will also need to, to have some modular solutions on uh, higher uh, capacity um, plants. Uh, because uh, there's a market for small plants, but there's also a lot of projects that are to be done with uh, bigger plants. I want to be a bit more provocative here, actually, because I think to speed up ship, we need quotes. I don't believe in, in the volunteer of industry, you know, in these very difficult markets where there's a lot of, you know, shifting to other countries and they look very much for their costs and so on. So uh, we have in India this interesting approach that they are actually have already in on below the table, you know, a quote that will force the industry to say you have to do 10% renewable energy in your heat demand. And they have not put it up yet because they have still doubts about the ship technology which is available and whether it's, you know, efficient enough. But I think that we need um, sort of regulations to make industry aware. And China is showing the game sort of because they make so hard sanctions against companies that keep on using all coal boilers to keep up their clean air, you know. And maybe this is a bit hard, but I need some kind of regulatory framework would be really helpful. Right, well, that's a, an interesting thought. And actually, I don't know any technology in in energy, really, that hasn't been uh, hasn't uh, received a boost from uh, regulation at one point or another, and uh, it's a very uh, not a very well known uh, fact. But the industry that receives the most subsidy still is the fossil fuels industry. So, um, <laughs> so uh, Miguel, do you um, do you want to add anything to to this uh, question? So, what would uh, what would need to happen for uh, concentrated solar heat systems to be widely deployed? I think one important thing for the technology, and I'm going to speak from the uh, technology point of view, is a standardization. I, I, and I, I don't mean normalization. I mean, we have to, to, to do the, the same thing we have, because we need something standard to, to be able to replicate, actually. Otherwise, every project is different. Uh, clients cannot refer to other projects because are completely different. Uh, we have to design every integration from every customer and that's very, very hard. So we have to do the same that the traditional boilers does. So you, you need a boiler and you have one boiler uh, off the shelf ready to, to be used. In, if it is possible, we have to move to, to that uh, kind of uh, ready to be used product. I think uh, that would completely change the, the situation. I think PV actually photovoltaics is something like that. And we have to, to be more like PV in, in that sense. Interesting. So, um, and then referring to something that uh, was in Barbell's presentation. So you mentioned Barbell that um, one of your goals is to um, speak with companies that have sustainability targets by themselves. So. I don't know, have any of you who are, you know, with us today, like either Rami or Miguel or, or you, Babel, actually spoken with some of these companies that have sustainability targets? Are they thinking about heat or, um, or, or not? What have you found? <laughs> Well, actually, you know that I have even started, only started the very first um, approach, which makes making these network organizers answer any kind of request. Because I thought the first idea would be, you know, to get in contact with RE100 and ask them, how are you organized? Do you have an office? Are you interested in a webinar on ship? Whatever, you know, I have, I have had such a hard time to even making these networks answer to any kind of email phone or whatever so i cannot really say what the companies behind these networks think about but i will not give up <laughs> i'm not that easy to give up but actually that's why i feel it's challenging and i'm really needing like i just wanted to blow this well, bowl into the open arena and see whether others are more successful. These companies, you can download them by Excel, you know, like you can download 600 companies with their name and their site, and they are all committed to do 100% renewable electricity by a certain year. 
So I wonder if this is a client group. I have not phoned them up yet, actually. I tried to get to the network organizers first because I thought we can use them as multipliers for our message. And I hope that I will reach them also. But let's see. <laughs> I haven't really got that far yet with contacting them. But any, anybody who has success in reaching out to them, get in contact with me, please. Well, not me, not yet. <laughs> if I do, I'll let you know. So, um, well, um, I mean, I don't know where this hour has gone, but it turns out that it's already six o'clock here in, in Spain. So um, I'm afraid that the, uh, we have run out of time. And um, I'd like to... Uh, Thank all of uh, you who have been here with us uh, for watching the webinar and to all of the uh, speakers, of course. Thank you, Barbo, Miguel, uh, Remy for being here. Um, also, I'd like to remind everyone that we will definitely send you the uh, webinar recording and the presentations. So don't worry, it will be up within a couple of days or so uh, by Monday at the latest. So, uh, um, Right, so would you like to uh, say any, um, any, anything else to the audience before we uh, go each go our way? So no, not on my side. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to everybody for, for attending. Yeah, thanks from my side as well. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you also from my side. Sorry because it's very dark, but the, the sun just... It's going down in Spain too, like in everywhere. And it's, it has to be a pleasure. We can yeah. say that you're saving energy. Yeah, I'm saving energy. So yeah. I try to increase the brightness of the screen, but it's not working. So, um, well, I'd just like to uh, point out that this webinar was made possible by the World Bank program MENA CSD Kit. And uh, you can uh, see resources on concentrated solar heat and concentrated solar power at uh, menacspkit.com. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll send you this, uh, this webinar recording and the presentations. Thank you very much, all of you, and, um, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.